Good morning, Crossroads. Are you ready to worship? Hello. Are you ready to worship? Anybody out there? Get on your feet.
is a sling in my voice and a stone in my praise pushing back when the darkest weapons fall there's a power on my lips even death can defy when the name of our God is lifted high Cause there is resurrection power And we sing the name of Jesus Resurrection power And we raise a mighty sound So come on, let the praise get loud Make that empty grave raise out There is resurrection There are days I have seen Filled with heartache and loss That have buried my heart in me away. But every time this praise breaks out Dead things rise up from the ground I won't leave my song inside that empty grave Cause there is resurrection
in his name. All right, kiddos, you can come on down and head to the outback. You are dismissed. creation longs to have the words to sing but this joy is mine with a thousand hallelujahs we magnify your name you alone deserve the glory the honor and the praise Lord Jesus this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Who else would die for our redemption? Whose resurrection means our eyes? There is time enough to sing of all you've done, but I have eternity to try. With a thousand hallelujahs, we magnify your name. You alone deserve the glory, the honor, and the praise, Lord Jesus. This song is for yours. A thousand hallelujahs, a thousand words. to the
This song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Good morning, Crossroads. Um, so, as usual, I'm going to talk about one of the songs that we sang. Um, so, it says that um, there's resurrection power um, in the name of Jesus. And, man, that is so true. But there's a, a lyric that I was thinking about while we were singing. I was actually, I couldn't even focus on this song because I was thinking about it. It says, captives let go of those chains. And so many times Jesus sets us free, but we're so conditioned um, to the chains and the bondage we were in. We're the only ones um, keeping ourselves tied up. We're the only ones keeping ourselves from being free. Um, so I just want to, and I just want to pray for that today. If you would bow your heads and close your eyes. God, you are all powerful. You are trustworthy and you are always faithful. God, I pray today that you would give us the power just to let go of the chains that are holding us back. That relationships would be restored. That marriages would be healed. That God, we will be able to look at your power and not try to rely on ourselves. that we will be able to look at you and see your faithfulness and your glory and take our eyes off of ourselves and look to you. God, I pray today, um, just as Wayne preaches and as we listen, that God, you would help us to open our hearts and, uh, and look inward, look at ourselves, not look at anybody else, not focus on other people's shortcomings, but just look how we can live to honor and glorify you. God, we love you and we praise you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you may be seated. Good morning. How are we doing today? Yeah? Uh, so, um, before we go any further, let me just tell you what's happened here this past week. We had VBS this week and uh, yeah, it was great. Had a great time. Uh, phenomenal. So, uh, if you see Miss Renee, um, just tell her you appreciate all that she has done. Uh, it, it is a lot of work, especially when you have a full-time job that's not here, right? That's a lot of work, and she did that this week. We had a great time. Grateful for that. Um, and then this next weekend, so all week we'll be getting ready. This next weekend is, e, is our E320 Youth Conference. Yes, right? And so that'll be here, um, start Thursday night with the parent dinner, uh, Friday night with our students, Saturday night with our students, and then Sunday morning uh, we will finish up. I'm excited for you because uh, next Sunday morning, the speaker for E320 will be here. He's going to speak. He's a lifelong friend of mine. He has spoken literally all over the world. He has written books. He's a great guy. I taught him everything he knows. Um, he will be here. Brian Hausman will be here next week with us. And so I'm excited. You will not want to miss next week. He is a phenomenal communicator um, and just is just really excited about being here. So along those lines, uh, a couple things that you need to be aware of. So number one, um, we have about 78 signed up for our youth conference this time, and we're really excited about that. However, um, we've got about 15 of those that will need uh, some help with the fees that it costs to, to put the conference on. So if you're interested in sponsoring a child, a student, excuse me, a student, um, then just see me uh, on the way out. Just let me know that you're willing to do that, and I'll get you the information that you need to know about that, okay? Um, also, um, this from uh, starting this Wednesday night until the end of August, our children's ministry on Wednesday night is going to take a break. Um, <laughs> Miss Renee needs a break. Um, and I hear some of the volunteers, yay, we need a little break. So we will have uh, children's uh, kids' worship on Sunday morning, um, but just for a little while, get back into school, let them get you. We're going to take a little break from that. So because of that and because we'll be getting ready for E320, we will not have adults meeting here this Wednesday night. Just be, be aware of that. This Wednesday night, this place is going to be being transformed for our uh, E320. Um, youth will meet. They will meet off campus. Um, you'll be getting information about that. So I think I covered everything I need to, except to remind you again, when you see Miss Renee, tell her, pat her on the back and give her a hug. Tell her she's done a great job, okay? Because we, we had a great time this week with our food truck VBS. So we are continuing through our journey through the New Testament. We're just walking straight through the New Testament. And we're on Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. 
And we're going to be looking today at verses 22 through 27. Now, I'm going to cover the whole, the whole book, uh, the whole chapter of, of Acts 24. But I didn't want to, <laughs> it's a lot to read. And so I thought, well, let me see where we can do, what we can do. So we're going to read these verses. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to we're just kind of give you some context and, and fill you in, tell the story basically, because it's a, it's a fascinating story uh, of what happens and when, to get us to the point where we're going to begin reading today. So I want to read that with you. You follow along. If you don't have a copy of God's Word um, and you, it's just because you don't have one, then you need to see me before you leave. We'll be glad to help you. You know, sometimes it's like I go, I, I've had somebody say, I went to get one, a, a Bible. And when I got there, there were so many, I didn't know which one to get. There's all these different, you know, versions of scripture. Um, We can help with that. Or maybe it's just they're expensive and they are expensive. And so if that's the case, uh, just see me. We would be glad to help you get a copy. But if you didn't bring a copy today, that's okay. We're going to have the verses on the screen so you can follow along behind me. Let's start with verse 22 of Acts chapter 24. At that point, Felix, who was quite familiar with the way, adjourned the hearing and said, Wait until Lysias, the, gar- the garrison commander, arrives. Then I will decide the case. He ordered an officer to keep Paul in custody, but to give him some freedom and allow his friends to visit him and take care of his needs. A few days later, Felix came back with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, sending for Paul. They listened as he told them about faith in Jesus Christ. As he reasoned with them about righteousness and self-control in the coming day of judgment, Felix became frightened. Go away for now, he replied. When it is more convenient, I will call for you again. He also hoped that Paul would bribe him, so he sent for him quite often and talked with him. After two years went by in this way, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, and because Felix wanted to gain favor with the Jewish people, he left Paul in prison. Now, I want us to go back. I want to go back and just kind of give you some context and catch you up. How did we get to this point, right? And so it, we really need to go back to the beginning of chapter 24 just to say that Paul had gotten himself into some trouble in Jerusalem. Paul had kind of uh, gotten sideways with the Jewish leaders, the rulers, the officials in, in, there, in uh, Jerusalem. And so now they had gotten a case against Paul and the case had been taken to Caesarea because Caesarea was the headquarters of the Roman world in that region. And so Felix, the governor of this region, is going to hear the case against Paul. So these Jewish officials, they come to to bring this case against Paul before Felix, and they were smart enough to hire a lawyer. So they bring a lawyer with them, and history tells us this was a, a very adapt lawyer. Like he was good at laying out a case against somebody, and his name was Tertullus. And so Tertullus was there, and he, can't, he comes with these officials. They stand before Felix, and they're going to make this case against Paul. Now, I want you to know, if you've been here, if this is your first time, if you haven't been here very often, you'll learn a little bit about this pastor today. I love movies and television. You know that about me, right? I, I, I do. It's just, I don't know why. My wife wished I didn't so much sometimes, but I do. And, and I know I'm not the only one, right? Right. right. Thank you. A few of you like yeah. movies and TV, right? So what you have to do in this setting is what we often have to do in scriptures. You have to make this into a movie in your mind, right? So you can see there, just imagine a courtroom and you can imagine this, you know, high dollar lawyer. Maybe in your mind, it's Matthew McConaughey or, you know, I don't know, Tom Cruise is pretty popular right now because of Maverick, you know, whatever. But you picture this person, Josh Lucas for my wife, probably she likes him as a lawyer. What? You do like him as a lawyer? Okay. I don't, know, I don't know why that was shocking. That's not a big deal. Like, so whoever it is in your mind, you put this person in your mind. And then imagine as they step up. And this is a, this is a lawyer who's good at what he does, right? He's good. So you expect that he's going to lay out this brilliant case of all the evidence and all the facts that he has against Paul, right? But he starts out like, as the smart lawyer that he is, right? He starts out by buttering up Felix. Now, when I say buttering up, I mean, like, we're talking about snow shovel size to, to clear a path. I mean, he is laying it on thick because he first comes, uh, when he stands up, he says, first, let me say that you, governor, are 
the most noble uh, governor. He's like talking about how noble Felix is, right? Your most noble Felix, which is ironic because Felix was the only governor in, I think, the history of Rome who started their life out as a slave. So he started out as a slave and he made his way to being governor of that region. Now, we could say, whoa, that's awesome. What a rags to riches story, right? What, that should be praised. Somebody should give him credit for that, right? But when you know the history of who Felix was, you understand how he got to that position, which was by basically bribery, you know, it being deceitful, being immoral, doing anything. You've heard those people that say, you know, that person would uh, betray their mama to make a sale, or that person would betray their mama to get a, uh, a promotion, right? Well, this is, this is, Felix would have done anything, and he did. He used anybody and anything that he could to his advantage to get where he was. So it's kind of funny, right, that he's saying most noble, when I would call what he did anything, lots of things, but I don't know that I would call it noble, but he's trying to get in good graces, and we'll find out later on why it was so important to get in the good graces of Felix, right? He is trying to get in these good graces, and so he says, you are, you are most noble, and then he says that um, you uh, have brought peace and prosperity to the region. You brought peace and prosperity to the region. So not only are you a noble governor, you're the governor who brought peace and prosperity to the region, which is very interesting because historically, just before this moment where Paul is brought to trial, um, Felix had ordered the massacre of thousands of Jewish people in Caesarea, where they are, and he took all their land, their possessions, and their wealth, and he gave it to wealthy Romans. I mean, this is, bring, this is one way to bring peace and prosperity. And how is it that these Jewish officials are sitting there listening to this, and they're okay with all this? Right? Because Tertullus is not trying to do anything but lay, on it, lay it on thick because he's going, he's going to now lay out his case against Paul. And we'll see why he had to butter him up so much, right? So he, he lays out all this uh, flattery, right? These flattering lies about who uh, Felix was. And so then he says, and you can see it in verse 5 if you want to look, but he says, um, I'm going to bring my case. And he says, first, we have this accusation. Now, in the scripture, I think it says he's a plague, or I think, it, you know, you, depending on which version you read, there's a lot of different adjectives used to describe what, he's, what the accusation that he brings. But the reality is, this is what he says. Felix, you got to understand, Paul is bothering us. I mean, that's really what he says. He says, listen, Paul is just, bo he's bothersome, and we're tired of him. Now, I don't know, that's probably can get on somebody's nerves, or there can be an issue with that. But is it illegal to be a bother? If that's the case, I probably broke the law a lot with a lot of you in here because I get on your nerves a lot, I'm sure. Um, but is it illegal? I mean, really? And he says, listen, they're just, he's a bother. He's just bothering us. You need to do something about him. And then he says, he is a ringleader of the Nazarenes. Now, you and I both know if I say, uh, you know, James Graham, he's one of the leaders at Crossroads. Well, that's a compliment, right? You, you know, but if somebody says you're a ringleader of something, that group of boys, he's the ringleader, right? Or those thugs, he's the ringleader. Ringleader brings with it this connotation that is not good. And even in the original language, what that's translated from is the same connotation. This is not a good thing. He is a ringleader of the Nazarenes. Now, even if you are a ringleader of some group that's doing something bad, just being the ringleader does, is not a crime, right? There's nothing wrong. It's just he is being accused of this. And then finally, he says, he tried, he tried to profane the temple. This is the only charge that Tertullus brings that could have some validity. It's the only one. So after giving all this flattering lies to Felix, he lays out the case against Paul. And what does he have? Like, he knows, this brilliant lawyer knows he has nothing. He has nothing. So you know what he does? He says, now, here's my case. He is a ringleader of the Nazarenes. He's bothering us. And he may have profaned the temple. 
I don't really have anything else, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say this. We trust you, governor. You are so great. We trust you. So why don't you? I tell you what, just ask Paul. Paul will tell you. Now, have you ever heard of a lawyer saying, we don't really have much evidence, but if you ask the defendant, he'll tell you the truth. Well, that's what he did. He said, this is my evidence right here. So, I mean, this is my case right here. So I tell you what, just ask Paul. If you want to know what's going on, you just ask Paul, and he will tell you that all these things are true. He was counting on Paul standing up and saying, well, they're right, governor. Just put me in jail. I did all those things. That's what he was counting on. That was his whole case. And so Felix turns to Paul. Well, Paul, what do you have to say for yourself? So Paul stands, and Paul takes a cue from, uh, from Tertullus. He, he begins to flatter the governor. He says, well, governor, here's what I'll say about you. You've been a judge around here for a long time. That's it. <laughs> That's all that he's trying to think of something positive to say because he knows who this man is. He knows what he's done. Have you ever been in that situation where you want to say something nice and you're just racking your brain trying to, you know, find something nice to say about somebody? And you finally, you're like, you know, uh, those are nice shoes, <laughs> right? You just, I don't know. I can't say much, but you got nice shoes on. I'll tell you that, you know. And that's what happened. Paul gets up and he's like, okay, well, he said something nice about the governor. I guess I need to say something nice about him too. Uh, you've been a judge for a long time. He didn't say you've been a good judge. You've been a bad, you just, you've been a judge for a long time. And that's where it ends. There was nothing else. He didn't say anything else flattering at all. That was, uh, that was it. That's all he had to give. That was the extent of the flattery because Paul knew who this man was. And he was not going to lie to try to get in good with this judge, this, this governor. And so he says, listen, I'm accused of being a plague. I'm accused of being a bother. Where's the proof? I am accused of being the ringleader of this sect. Where's the proof? I'm accused of profaning the temple. Where is the proof? This happened just 12 days ago. If I had done any of these things, wouldn't there have been some eyewitnesses? I mean, it's not like in 12 days they're going to forget what happened. Wouldn't there have been somebody to stand up and testify against me? Where are they? Where are the eyewitnesses? Where are the people who can say what I have done? There aren't any. Paul had the truth on his side. And because of that, he was willing to stand up and say the truth. He didn't have to be afraid. Now, listen, some of us, we've been followers of Christ for a long time in this room. Some of us have. And as long as we've been a follower of Christ, we've never shared our faith with anybody. And the reason is fear. But we have the truth on our side. If you are truly a follower of Christ, if you truly believe what God's word says, then you have the truth on your side. What do we have to be afraid of? But yet we use that as an excuse, don't we? Well, I'm not sure what to say. I'm not sure how to go. I'm not. But if it's the truth, we are not responsible for the results. We just have to share and allow God to move and allow God to do what God is going to do. We don't share. We don't let fear stop us from sharing. We share because we know, we truly believe that God's word, the gospel is the truth. And, and Paul says, that's the whole case. That's it. They have no evidence and I didn't do it. <clears throat> So now it's your choice. It's your time, Felix. You've got to make the decision. And so now the ball is in Felix's court. Felix now has to do something. He has to make a decision. What do I do? Do I let Paul go or do I uh, put him in prison? And that's where we picked up with our reading just a little bit ago. It's Felix now has this on his shoulders to make uh, some sort of decision. And Felix has to say, well, let me see. 
I don't really want to ruffle anybody's feathers. There's really not any evidence over here on Paul's side, but I don't want to get in bad with these officials. And so he says, let me, let me wait on this decision until I can talk to the person who arrested Paul. Lysias will be here at some point. And when Lysias comes, uh, I, will, I will talk to him and then <clears throat> I will make the decision. Now, I can't just let Paul go. This would make all the, officials, the Jewish officials mad. I can't just let him go. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put him under house arrest. I'm not going to put him in prison. He won't be chained up to a wall or anything like that but he will be in our custody. He's free not to come and go as he pleases, but he is free. He can have visitors. They can bring him things. They can attend to his needs. And, and that's what we will do for now until I talk to Lysias. Well, as we read at the end, uh, he never talked to Lysias. As far as we know, Paul was there for two years and he never talked to him. He did not want to make this decision at all. The Bible says, and maybe one of the reasons, because the Bible says he knew, he, Felix knew something about the way. The way is what the believers, the early church believers were called. I think that's interesting. They were called the way because, you know, Christianity is not just a belief system. I mean, it is a belief system, but it's not just a belief system. It is a way, the way we live our lives. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, the life we follow after. So we can say, well, I believe in, in Jesus. I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. But do we really, if there's no change in our lives, if we're not following the way that Jesus has laid out for us to live our lives, the Bible says even the demons believe and they have one up on us because at least they fear God. So if, if there's not a change in our lives, are we really following the way or are we just giving a nod to the fact that we believe in God. I, I think that's interesting. Felix knew something about the way, and maybe that's why he said, I, I think I'll just hold off. I won't make any decisions right now. We're going to put Paul in, in custody in sort of a house arrest uh, kind of situation. And so Paul goes into house arrest. Custody, but not true freedom. And sometime after that, we don't know, it may have been three days, it may have been 45 days, we have no idea, but at some days later, maybe, I don't know, uh, Felix and Drusilla are sitting around, his, his third wife, Drusilla, they're sitting around, she's a Jewish lady, and so they, maybe there's no good sporting events on the, you know, at the local whatever, you know, and the, or maybe there's no good movies. Maverick wasn't playing anymore. They'd already taken it out. And so they decide, hey, while we're just sitting here, let's bring Paul in and let's let him tell us about faith in Jesus Christ. And so um, they, bring, they bring Paul in and they say, hey, um, why don't you um, tell us about um, faith in Jesus Christ? Now, Let's be transparent today, okay? If this was you or if this was me and we get summoned by the governor, the person who, listen, we're not, we haven't been convicted. We're still, and, and we have an opportunity. I get to go talk to the governor, not one-on-one, -on -one, but two-on-one. -on There's going to be nobody else in the room. What would our mind, where would our minds go? All right, what can I say that's going to make him let me go, right? That's where we would go. What can I do? So he wants to know about faith in Jesus Christ. What's the most gentle, easy thing that I can tell him so that when I get finished, he will be okay with what I said, but also want to let me go? No, it, wouldn't you want to do that? No. I don't know. I don't know if you would or not. Like I'm, I'm kind of uh, ambivalent with you about what, what, you're, what you're trying to... Listen, wouldn't you want to get out of being uh, under house arrest? Wouldn't you want to get to go and have your freedom? Complete freedom, right? You would. And so you would start to think, okay, what is it that I can say that I, that'll make my point about not really going against what I believe about Jesus, but at the same time, I mean, I don't want to ruffle Felix's feathers any further, right? That's how we would be. I don't know about you. That's absolutely how I would be. I, I kind of like to tell people what they want to hear sometimes. I have to be careful about that because I'm a pleaser, right? If you, 
all the fellow people pleasers, you know what I'm talking about. And so we have to be careful about that. But that's what I would do. I would have marched myself in there and I would have said everything that he wanted to hear so that I could get out. And so why wouldn't Paul do that? Well, that's the furthest thing from Paul's mind at this point. He absolutely does not. If you are taking notes today, I'll tell you that the title of this message should probably just be a simple sermon. It was a simple sermon preached, but it was probably very difficult to hear. So Paul marches in there and he says, okay, Felix, you want to you know about Jesus Christ? I got a three-point sermon for you. Here's what we're going to talk about tonight, Felix. We're going to talk about righteousness, and we're going to talk about self-control, and we're going to talk about the judgment to come. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what Paul said. It just says he talked about these three things. So I have some ideas about that, right? But anything that Paul said, I guarantee you, it wasn't pleasing to Felix. It wasn't to try to get, he wasn't buttering Felix up to try to get out of prison. As a matter of fact, Paul probably thought, if I say these things, there's a good chance I'm going to die. Because he went hardcore when you talk about those things. So let's just imagine he walked in. Hey, you want to know about Jesus? Let me tell you. First, righteousness. You, you think you're righteous. You think you're something special. You think that you are great because you are governor. I have news for you. Being governor, being all the things, conquering people, doing everything that you have done means nothing unless you have righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. You're not righteous. You're not good. And we know that, right? Every one of us in this room knows deep down inside, there's nothing good about us. We're, we're human. We're flawed. We're sinners. That, that's who we are. That's who I am at my core. And so he tells him, Felix, understand you're not good. The only thing that's going to help you, the only, it's not your righteousness when you stand before God. It's taking on the righteousness of Jesus. That's why he came. That's why he went to the cross. That's why he died. And Felix, listen, it's a pretty good exchange. You exchange your sinfulness for his righteousness. And the message that Paul said that day to Felix is the same message that is still true today. Listen, in this room today, all you have to do is be willing to exchange all the bad, sinful things that you've ever done in your life for Christ's righteousness when he died on the cross. His, his blood on the cross covers our sin. Now, look, that, that's powerful. And for, for Paul to go into that room that day and to look at the governor face to face and to say, hey, you think you're good? You're not. I'm not good. And Paul understood that because Paul probably could have said, let me share, let me share a little bit about my life. I used to kill people just like myself. I would have them murdered. But you know what? When I stand before God one day, I'm not going to stand based on what I did. I'm going to stand based on who Jesus was. I can stand face to face with God, not on my merit because I don't have anything. If you look at my life, it, it is a, a life where I didn't follow after God for so long. I thought I was following God, but I wasn't. I was following after myself, and I was following after the world, and I was following after the Jewish leaders, and I had people killed. If I had to stand on that, I would be condemned. But Felix, I don't have to stand on that. You know what I can stand on? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. I can stand on his death on the cross, his burial in the grave, and his resurrection from the tomb. That's what I can stand on. And Felix, you can stand on that too. And listen to everybody in this room today. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how bad you think you are, you know what? You don't have to stand on your merit either. You can stand on the merit of Jesus Christ. Now, if that wasn't bold enough, Felix, uh, Paul says, all right, Felix, let's go to number two. Point number two, we I mean, probably need to talk about self-control. And here's why. Because there's a void in your life. Why do you get drunk every night, Felix? Why do you do that? Because there's something missing in your life. Felix, let me ask you a question. This third wife you have that you stole from her husband, who's not even 20 years old yet, like there's a reason for that. I think it's a lack of self-control. And listen, Drusilla, you think that that's the last, you're his last one? Unless something changes, unless he starts to depend on the righteousness of Christ, nothing's going to change. It's going to be the same thing over and over and over again. You ever wonder why? Man, I want to stop. 
I want to change. I want to be different. But man, I keep going down the same roads. Maybe it's because you're still relying on yourself and you're not relying on the righteousness of Christ. In and of ourselves, we have no self-control. We, we can't do what we want to do. Paul himself said, the things I don't want to do, that's what I do. The things that I want to do, I don't do. That's the apostle Paul that said that. And so he stands before Felix, and he says, listen, all the things that you're doing that you think are going to make a difference in your life, all those things that you're trying to fill up those holes in your life with, nothing is ever going to satisfy you. You can have all the wives in the world. It's not going to satisfy you. You can have all the power in Rome. It's not going to satisfy you. What's going to satisfy you is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And for us today, it's the same thing. What's going to satisfy us What's going to truly bring satisfaction? You can have earthly pleasure. You can have some momentary satisfaction in your life. You know, but the reality is deep peace is not going to happen apart from Jesus Christ. And then he says, now, if that wasn't enough, Felix, do you know there's going to be a coming judgment? There's going to be a coming judgment when you're going to have to stand and you're going to stand before God. And you can either stand before God and you can try to give him an excuse for everything you've done. Or you can stand and say, I have no excuse, but I plead the blood of Jesus. I don't stand before you, God. There is a coming judgment. It's going to happen. You're either going to stand before God and you're going to have to say, here's why I did this and here's why I did this and here's why I did this. And there will be no excuse except. None. Or you can stand in before God and you can say, not by my righteousness, but by the righteousness of Jesus. Not by my life, but by the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. Not by anything I've done, but by everything that Jesus did for me. And that's the same to us today. Here's the interesting part. Paul preaches this sermon. Paul tells them this, right? And you know what didn't happen? Send him to prison for the rest of his life. Get him out of my sight. I never want to see him again. Didn't happen. Off with his head. Kill him right now. Beat him senseless. Didn't happen. Paul spoke with such authority and with such passion. And Felix knew. I believe that even as he's telling them these hard things, that Felix and Drusilla were on the edge of their seat listening because it scared Felix. It bothered him. He, he heard enough. You know what he said? Hey, I'm going to get you to, I'm going to just going to need you to leave for a little while. I, I'll get back with you later. I'm going to need you to leave. I got to ponder these things. So often in our lives, God speaks to us. The Holy Spirit stirs our heart. And we are, we are right there. We're just right there. And you know what we do? Instead of dealing with it right then, we put it off. And as we put it off, you know what happens? We, we start to get our minds on something else. And, and that's why I've said many times here, when God's dealing with you on a Sunday, you can, you can put out of your mind, you can leave. And when you get outside these walls, you know what happens? Man, all of the cares of the world and all of the distractions of the world come at you and you forget what God was dealing you about. You push it to the side and then you don't do it. And over time, that Holy Spirit that was dealing with you and dealing with you, you start to hear it less and less. And before you know it, you don't hear it anymore and you've not made the decision that you needed to make. And Felix, rather than dealing with what he had been confronting with, and I believe the reason that he didn't send Paul away and tell him to be beaten or stoned or killed was because he knew, he knew there was something about what Paul was saying. He knew it was the truth. He knew it. He could feel it. He could sense it. He knew it was the truth, but he just didn't have the strength to make a decision. He just put it off. And he said, just go away, I'm going to do it. And then the Bible says over time, he would call him back in and they would have conversations. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, it's interesting. We, so many times when we get in a circumstance, even as believers, we get in a circumstance and we look around and all we can see is our circumstance. 
all we do is spend our time praying, God, get me out of this, get me out of this, get me out of this. I want to be out of this circumstance. I want to be out of this situation. I don't like this. I don't want to be in it. Paul is in a terrible situation. Paul is in this circumstance. And you know what? Not one time does he pray, God, get me out of this. God, take me out of this situation. You know what he does? God, how can I glorify you right where I am? Sometimes, folks, we are in a situation because God is giving us an opportunity to bring glory back to God in the middle of what everybody around us would say, that's an awful situation. That's an awful circumstance. Instead of wanting to get out of it, God, how can I glorify you through it? How can I bring glory to you in it? And Paul, I think Paul said, hey, as long I will stay in house arrest as long as Felix gives me an ear. As long as he will listen to me talk about Jesus. As long as I can try to give him some guidance on what he needs to do. I will stay in house arrest as long as it takes. I will do it. Two years. And through all that time, as far as we know, Felix never, we know at the end, he, he never made that choice to follow Jesus. Never. But he had opportunities. And it made me think about this. How many opportunities over the years have we had, have you and I had, to follow Jesus? How many times have we heard a song or a message or we've had a friend in our lives or a family member in our lives come and share with us something and it's God trying to get our attention to try to get us back on track, get us going where we need to go, that they've done that and yet we just ignore it, yet we walk away, yet we don't do what we know we need to do. We have those opportunities. And Felix had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And he didn't do anything with it. How many opportunities have we missed where God's trying to get our attention? Two years. The successor for Felix is coming onto the scene. And so as Felix is going out, he says, I want to I want to do something that the Jews will, so they'll remember me well. You know, because he had massacred people and given their wealth away and done all these things. I want to do something. So he puts Paul in prison then. So for two years, Paul's in our house arrest. Now Paul gets sent to prison. Not a, not a country club prison. Prison. After Paul had spent time with him and, and done all those things, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to look at our situation and say, you know what? I want to um, glorify God in this situation. We have an opportunity to say, I'm not going to have to, I don't want to stand on my own righteousness because I know what my righteousness looks like and it's not very good. I want to stand on the righteousness of Jesus. I want to know him. I want to follow him. I want to hear him say at the end of my life, well done. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for your love and your grace to us, God. God, I thank you that um, today we have heard your word. And Father, I pray that you will use it for your kingdom's glory. God, we just give you this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to sing together. And as we do, there's a couple of... Uh, opportunities for you. Um, our prayer team will be in the back. So if you want somebody to pray with you about anything, you can slip out to the back. Just grab one of them. They'll be glad to do that. We have a place to kneel and pray right up here to the front. I'll be down front. Um, today, listen, if you would say, man, I know I'm relying on my righteousness and not the righteousness of Christ. If that's the case, then why wait? You have an opportunity today to say, I want to rely on the righteousness of Jesus starting today. Um, whatever you need to do this morning, you can put it off or you can say, I'm going to have the strength to do what God is calling me to do. Let's sing together. I 